God has specifically chosen you to be here at this time and in this place. You have incredible potential, purpose, and calling to push back the darkness and be a light for Christ. Stand for nothing and you'll fall for anything. It's time to stand your ground. This is Unapologetic. and welcome back to Unapologetic. I am so excited for today's episode. It is with New York Times bestselling author, Eric Metaxas. I've had the honor of knowing him for many years, hearing him speak, reading his books, and just being a witness to his amazing ministry and how God continues to use him to lead culture, lead the church, and lead in politics. Before you change the channel and think, oh, well, this is just two people that are agreeing on the same issues and same viewpoints, I'm going to throw a curveball here. I've never done this before in this show. Today, I argue the other side because I want us to get the questions answered that people really want answers to, questions people really have, arguments that are valid and ones that maybe ministers and politicians and authors don't always answer or they don't answer well. Eric is passionate about the gospel, about sharing the gospel, and about the Christian's responsibility to influence culture. Please help me welcome to the show, Eric Metaxas. Hi, Eric. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. So that is so kind. I want to leave because I can't possibly live up to that. That's really sweet. Thank you so much. We ask everyone on this show the number one question. What do you wish Christians would stop apologizing for? Their faith. It's kind of funny because I think to myself, it's it's like somebody gave you a lot of food and they're starving people. And you're like, well, I don't know if I want to share this because I might offend them or... I, I don't, and you think, wait a second, you've been given this blessing to be a blessing to others. So stop pretending that there are people out there who are starving, who don't want food. They want mm-hmm. food. Uh, and I think when we talk about our faith, we've all seen our faith misrepresented in a million ways. So we're not talking about that, but we're talking about the authentic faith, the love of Jesus, what that looks like. It is the most beautiful, hopeful thing in the universe. And I think that a lot of us have kind of gotten this idea that, well, I don't want to be too strong in my beliefs or I have to be careful. And well, look, we all want to be careful and we all want to be polite, but you're sharing something beautiful. Every human heart longs for the truth of Jesus, the truth of scripture. And we sometimes, I think, get tangled up thinking, well, yeah, but, yeah, but. And I think that there's no but. There are people out there that are dying to know, even does truth even exist, much less if it does, would it be available to me? And when you tell them, yes, truth is a person and he died for you and he loves you. And by the way, it's true. It's not a a myth. It's not a fairy tale. This is reality. The whole universe uh, is created by the God uh, who came to earth. I mean, when when we really know that's true, not to share it um, really becomes a terrible thing. And so I think that some of us are kind of living in half measures and, and we're sort of, we kind of act like our faith is sort of true, or maybe it's true for me. And I think, well, then you don't really have the faith you think you do, because when you understand what it is, you're burning to share anybody uh, who might want to hear it. Right. That's it. That reminds me of this quote. Uh, you know, people are so into their words of the year. I've never found a word of the year, but uh, Churchill has a great quote. Don't do your best, do what's required. And so much of the language right now is, well, I did my best, or I don't want to offend them. It's like, as Christians, we're called to what's required. We're required to share our faith. Like, that is why we're here. Um, But a lot of people kind of see it as an option. We spend a lot of time encouraging teenagers to witness, first to make sure that, of course, they're saved, but also that then they spend every opportunity, every relationship, knowing how to share their faith. And we've encouraged them to find a verse that motivates them or something that they say to themselves that propels them. And we give them ideas, but one of it is what you just said. We'll tell them, remind yourself when you're scared or when you feel like you should pull back, you're not sharing your opinion. Like it is the truth. It is the only way people don't go to hell. And I think that just whatever can reframe that, because we do, we are pretty persuaded to 
pull back and be ashamed and not not tell the truth. Not you. You do a great job of it. But culture does try to get us not to do that. Do you have any suggestions for how we can be strong in our faith? Well, one one thing is kind of funny because the my newest book is my shortest book. It's called Letter to the American Church. But the book that came out just before that is called Is Atheism Dead? And it's really apologetics. Um, and it plays on the idea that in 1966, Time Magazine had a cover story that said, Is God Dead? And we've been all living, anybody my age and younger has been living with this narrative that somehow, you know, faith is uh, wobbly, uh, faith is on the outs, science is disproving faith. That is completely untrue, um, but we've been living with it. And I discovered a few things in the, in the course of uh, the last years that were so astonishing in terms of apologetics, proof of God from science, mm-hmm. from archaeology. I said, the evidence for God is way beyond what even I thought was possible. And I want to get this into the hands of Christians yeah. and say to them, hey, if you ever doubted your faith, read this. The evidence is overwhelming. It's kind of like wondering, I wonder if the flat earthers have a point. And you, you realize, no, they don't. That's been settled. When, when, when I wrote the book, Is Atheism Dead? I said, I've got to get this, these apologetics, new apologetics really, into the hands of Christians to say to them, listen, your faith is absolutely true. The God who invented the universe, who enabled us to do science, it all points back to him. Science points back to God more now than it did 30 years ago. So I want to encourage people to say that before you can really successfully share your faith or live out your faith, you need to know that it's real. It's not just something your parents told you, or it's not sort of real. It is reality. It's the truth of the universe. And I think that the more we know that, um, the more bold we'll be. You can't help but be bold when you really know something is true. We always talk about making a connection. Like, honestly, if anyone tried to argue anything scientific with me, I don't, like, that's not a stumbling block for me. Like, I don't, I believe it. Like, but that's because of how I grew up. And that's not necessarily the things that I'm interested in. Like, I'm very interested in why a Christian who has the Holy Spirit still struggles with addiction. And that's why I became a therapist. So I think not being scared and acknowledging that people have things that are stumbling blocks for them. Yes. And we can't pretend like scripture answers every question. Some things are a mystery, but... That is one, that's yeah. one of my favorite things. Mm-hmm. It thrills me to hear you say that because I talk about that all the time. Mm-hmm. I have a, a, a daily radio show. And I think, you know, when I'm talking to a friend uh, who whom God has used powerfully in healing and deliverance, but I talk to him about all the cases where you pray and pray and pray and the person doesn't get healed or... And we have to be honest. We have to say uh, uh, there's no magic answer. Sometimes there's a mystery. And I think we have to be comfortable with that. We have to say God is God. We can know what we know, but I can't prove God to somebody who's not interested. I I can't uh, even answer questions that I've been asking for decades. So we can know what we can know. But we have to stop pretending like believing in the God of the Bible means I've got all the magic answers. Right. Part of the answer is things are a mystery. There's suffering in the world. There's difficulty in the world. Um, And being honest about that itself is a witness that I'm not wedded to some ideology. I'm wedded to what is true and what is real. And God doesn't tell me to kind of like gin up some kind of a fake happiness uh, in the midst of, of, of brokenness. There's a deep joy, but that's different from, you know, kind of a plastic smile. And I think that that's that's a powerful witness to people who are struggling to see that even those who have powerful faith, that in some ways they struggle and they have questions. That's really healthy. We had a girl in the suit mystery and she had decided to become a witch. And I don't know why they were all trying to find me. They were like, where's Julia? Where's Julia? And I was like, okay. And I sat down with her and I used counseling Julia, not ministry, not ministry apologetics. And so I just tried to connect with her. And I said, you know, what's going on? Where did this come from? Why are you interested in this? I'll tell the short version. And she said, because I prayed to God to heal my dad and he died. Well, instead of saying, well, don't you know he's in heaven? Well, don't you know that this world is sinful and that death's just part of it? Like connecting first, like that's a real problem, like praying for your dad to live and he dies. And then she went to school, a witch 
started talking to her and she saw like some like little trick or whatever. And she was more interested in that because she tangibly saw it. So instead of pretending just like, oh, that's absurd or trying to explain it away, like the connection of saying that is confusing, that is hard. And she expected me to say witchcraft wasn't real. I was like, that's real too, but it's not, it's of a different spirit. And I, I just know different people because of how their experience or how their mind works need to be reached in different ways. And I know a lot of scientists that they need that. They need you to prove it. I do want to ask you this because I grew up, 90s, 2000s, where we talked about apologetics all the time. Like I was reading Lee Strobel, Case for Christ and all of that. And I mean, I loved it. And it seems like there's a switch now. I mean, honestly, now with today's young people and millennials, I'm having to even just explain what I'm talking about. Like this is what the word theology means. Has there been a shift in uh, literacy or understanding? We're just getting very elementary where everyone does not even kind of have the same frame of reference anymore. Yeah. Well, it depends what culture you grow grow up in, but American culture has become increasingly secular. Uh, and I think a lot of the things that we could have taken for granted a couple of decades ago, we can't now, you can't assume that somebody, uh, if you say the Bible says this, that they're going to care. You know, you, you have to find people where they are. But the God who created every one of us uh, wants to reach every one of us. And, and we have to start wherever we have to start, you know, and the yeah. Lord knows and the Holy Spirit knows. You know, mm -hmm. we pray, Lord, show me the way in or, or lead me as I stumble around. Show me uh, how I can show your love because everybody needs a different thing. Right. And I remember when I was 24, I was not a believer. And I remember, um, you know, somebody shared with me uh, C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. And I was like reading it. It meant nothing to me. It, it just did not do for me what the person thought that it would do. And I think to myself, how weird, because what an amazing book. C.S. Lewis doesn't get better. But the point is, whatever I was looking for was not that. But the Lord knows what we're looking for. And so if we, you know, it's the cliche, if we meet people where they are, and it doesn't matter, you know, there's no formula. But if you if you live out your faith, you show people the love of Christ and that that you are, you're open to whatever is true. It's not like you're trying to sell something. You're, you're, you're trying to sell reality and truth. And I just think when people see that honesty, a lot of people today, it, it speaks to them. If they see you being honest, um, uh, it, it, it means more than anything, frankly. We're going to switch gears here to me arguing the other side in just a second. We should have had two shows. But apologetics, people, people don't know what to say whenever they have a family member that's smarter than they are. And they apparently, you know, claiming to be wise became fools. They have, you know, given in to any kind of ideology and they think like, oh, well, that person must know more than I do, or I could never have something to share with them. And we talk about how you just study what's brought in your life. Like I've, I had a season where I had a lot of Jewish friends. Well, I didn't know a ton about Judaism. I've been a Christian since I was five, but then I became I'm very um, aware of Judaism and I studied it so that I could minister to that person. I think people kind of can forget that you can study things as an adult and get good at it in order to reach the people in your life. Well, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, again, we, um, all of reality was created by God and points to him. Right. So you can really start anywhere. Uh, it, it's not like, well, you've got to stick to theological stuff. All of reality points to God. And I think that one thing Christians have to know as well is that it's not your job to get people saved. That's God's job. And I think that Christians often feel like, well, I've got to start uh, to debate somebody or I've got to, sometimes not saying anything might be the most powerful thing you could do that day. That somebody says, well, you're not going to be preaching in my ear. Okay. So maybe next time, uh, if I have a question, I won't be afraid to ask it because you're not going to hit me with both barrels of what you've been taught in your Sunday school or something. And I think that <laughs> yes. that idea that we have to, have to like argue people into the kingdom, mm -hmm. sometimes, honestly, the best thing you can do is you play the long game right. and you say, I'm going to pray for this person. I'm going to be there. I'm going to show them love if they have a question or whatever. 
but I'm not going to try to hunt them down because frankly, the Lord is usually not calling us to do anything like that. Uh, and, and I think that when you try that, honestly, you're pushing people away. That's the last thing the Lord wants us to do is to argue somebody away from Christian faith. Uh, and so I think we, we have to be careful as much as he wants us to share our faith. There are times when the way you do that uh, is by being humble and quiet uh, and not arguing with somebody. You know, if somebody wants to believe something crazy, maybe now's not the time for you to disabuse them of their crazy notions. Uh, sometimes that'll come up uh, another time. Sometimes it'll never come up. But maybe today, you know, the best thing I can do is just just be there and and not go after them with argument. That's so good. I have a principle in my life that I live by because I'm prophecy, spiritual gift, and evangelist, and my dad's a Baptist pastor, um, oldest child syndrome. But if someone's really like in that's in my life, in my sphere, about to completely go off the rails or make a completely, I mean, like life altering, incorrect decision, lifestyle, I tell them once, like, that's my rule. Like, I'm going to share the truth once in love so they know where I stand. But then I'm going to keep the relationship because we need to keep the conversation and the door open. And then also that way I'm not manipulating every single conversation to try to be like, hmm, what do you think the Bible says about that? But I, I like unapologetically say it once. That's just a practice we do so that we know they know where we stand, but then we continue to love them. We need to switch gears. I could talk to you forever. I knew that whenever um, I was around you in New York. So let's talk about arguing the other side of uh, America, a Christian nation, the American church, church and politics. I am going to ask you the questions I hear most often from young people and that I think that you would be able to answer. So for clarity for our listeners, I do not believe the Bible says go into all the world and make Republicans or Democrats or vegans or Cowboys fans. But there is a connect between how God uses nations and Christians. And honestly, a lot of people are really bad at explaining that. Ministers aren't usually good at it. Politicians aren't great. Authors aren't great. Eric Metaxas is great at it. So we're going to talk about this. Okay. First thing, Christians being in politics is not the yeah. point of the gospel. We're not supposed to go into the world and make someone a part of our political party. Well, I mean, that's true and not true. Let's let's go back to, I wrote a book about William Wilberforce, mm -hmm. who, when he came to faith in the late uh, 1700s, he was in politics. And he knew that because he'd come to faith in the God of the Bible, that the God of the Bible said slavery is an abomination, and that he needed to use his role in politics to stand against the slave trade and to work in politics against the slave trade, that was political. But the Lord called him to do that, not because the goal is to be political, but the goal is to end this abomination that is harming human beings made in God's image. And people at the time said to him what they say to me or what they say to anybody who says anything political. They said, ah, 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 you're being political. Keep your faith separate from your politics. And Wilberforce thought, are you kidding? You mean I'm gonna be silent about the slave trade? Uh, my Christianity compels me to talk about that and to use anything I can use um, to defeat that evil, that, that corrupt monstrosity called the slave trade. So we applaud him today. We say, well, that, that was a different case. That was, that was Wilberforce, you know, yeah, he was political. And you think, well, yes, because he, he wasn't afraid to be political. He wasn't thinking that the goal is politics. But the point is to convince someone that slavery was wrong Everybody who disagreed with him said, oh, you're being political. And, and why are you trying to con convert me to your point of view, your religious point of view? And you think, well, because it's true, because God loves the people who are suffering under slavery. So if I'm convinced that Marxism or socialism uh, is going to crush the poor, and I know that that's true, am I going to be quiet about that? God calls me to love the poor. And so I'm going to say, that system and people advocating for that, which in, in America today is usually the left, mm -hmm. I would say, listen, I've got big problems with tons, mm -hmm. if not most, of the Republicans. But let me tell you something. You need to be careful. Mm -hmm. uh, this is really destructive. 
lives are at stake. Communities are being destroyed because of socialism and big government. And if you love those people, you're going to advocate for that. Mm -hmm. And you're going to advocate for representatives in government who are going to advocate for that. And when people say, ah, oh, you're being political, you say, well, call it what you want. God calls me to love the poor. And so I'm voting for that Republican in this case, not because I agree with everything he said or did, but because I believe his policies will bless the poor, will give them opportunities. And we have to be clear that when you vote for somebody, you don't, you're not agreeing with everything. It's like, you know, you pick a dentist. <laughs> you, you're, you're not saying, well, I, 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 uh, I picked this dentist because I agree with everything that you pick them because you say, this is their job. And, you know, I want to, I want to get somebody who's going to do a good job. And, you know, you hope you did the right thing, but you don't say, but if there's anything in his life that doesn't agree with that, I'm not going to go to that dentist. Mm -hmm. Basically, politics is the same thing. You're going to pick a flawed human being whom you think best for the job. And when people say, well, that's, that's got nothing to do with the gospel, it has everything to do with the gospel. Your faith is supposed to be lived out in every sphere. And the reason I wrote the new book, Letter to the American Church, is because so many people have bought into this confused idea, and it is harming people. If you love people, you, you've, you're going to have to be taking your faith into every, every part of life, to school boards, uh, into politics, uh, into the media, into everything. The Lord calls us to bring him and his hope and his truth into everything. So this crazy idea that, no, 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 you're just supposed to, quote, unquote, preach the gospel. You think, what gospel am I going to be able to preach if I don't believe in, in freedom, in freedom of expression, free, free speech? You know, and so we need to educate ourselves that these things are all connected. And the idea that I could just stay in this little theological lane, that's just not biblical. If it was biblical, I'd be all for it. But I don't believe that's what scripture says. In fact, I believe scripture says the opposite. So, yes, can you make an idol of politics? You can make an idol of anything. And the Lord commands you not to do that. But to say, I'm not going to have anything to do with that. It, it's just like saying, like, I don't want to love my country because I, I, I'm going to make an idol of my country and I'm supposed to be a citizen of the kingdom. That's like saying I'm not going to love my wife and my daughter or my parents because I might make an idol of that. I just need to love God. And I think, where did you get the idea that these are supposed to be in competition? Your love of God makes you love your family more, and your love of family should be a reflection of God. Can you make an idol of loving your family? Sure. Jesus says, you know, unless you hate your mother and father, he makes that point that God has to come first. But you're supposed to honor your mother and father. All these things are supposed to work together. Uh, and we've we've bought into a lot of these ideas that are just they're not biblical, and frankly, they're harming people's lives. And so we have to we have to try to get it right. Most people become Christians before they're fifteen. I did not grow up somewhere that had private school. All of my ministry experience, inviting my husband to church, seeing him saved, witnessing to my friends, all of that, like that it was the foundation of my life. That's been the story of my father's life. Many people, many of our ministry moments, our love for non-Christians, our ability to reach, minister, defend our faith. I've took on many teachers. That was all within public school. And so just kind of like practically fleshing out some things that you said, if we don't have those freedoms, it literally can cost people not being able to share the gospel, not being able to accept Christ. It's already yeah. happening. It's already happening. And, and listen, because my mother grew up in Germany and my father grew up in Greece, I know what it can right. be like to be outside of this country where people mm -hmm. lose the right to advocate for what they believe in. We in America have been so blessed. We don't appreciate that what we have is not normal. What we have is a gift from God, freedom is a gift from God, and we're meant to use it for God's purposes. We're not meant to take it for granted. We're not meant to say, oh, America's a bad country. Let me tell you, uh, people like my parents, they would have done anything to come to this country if they could. And I want to say that those of us who have the privilege of living here need to understand that God gives us this gift of freedom for his purposes. We're not to ignore it because there are all kinds of places around the world where if you say, I want to share the gospel— they will say, I will cut your head off. I will throw you in prison. I will, you will lose your job. In this country, we have tremendous freedom that way. And if you think it will last forever, it is already going away. A, a lot of the kind of woke policies and a lot of the cancel culture is working against American style freedom, which works against the proclamation of the gospel. So if you only care about it for that reason, you need to care about it.
we who are Christians and know how this all ends up, we know Jesus comes back. We know the the world's destroyed. God has a plan. People are being saved. Why, you know, we're kind of going more into the super, super uh, Calvinists here, but why do we even need to try to change the world when we know it's coming to an end? Well, because the Lord commands us to do that. Uh, if I see somebody uh, uh, wounded in the gutter and I walk past them, the Lord will judge me for that. He says, I called you to help those whom you could help and to do what you could do. I will decide when we're going to wrap it up, when we're getting out of here. I will decide when you know the universe melts. Until that time, you're my people filled with the Holy Spirit, and I command you to live out the faith you claim to have in every way possible. So when people say, what does it matter? That's the voice of the devil. Mm -hmm. That's not the voice of Calvinism. That's the voice of the devil saying, don't do anything. It doesn't matter. And let me also say that is, that is Eastern religion. Eastern religion says it's, it's that person in the gutter is just working out their karma. If you try to help them, you're just messing with their karma. Let them rot. Don't do anything good for them. The Christian faith says, I'm supposed to care about that person. I'm supposed to care about uh, the strangers who are suffering uh, and the neighbors who are suffering. And God calls me to do something about that. Uh, in, in the eternal scheme of things, the Lord is the one who decides the way things go. But he has deputized his church, and it's so clear from Scripture. And again, I, I, it's one of the main points of my the, the book letter to the American church is that the Lord says the church is the conscience of the state. We are wow. to be the Lord's voice and his arms and legs wherever we can in every single sphere. And how much success we have and how it goes, that's in the Lord's hands. But if we do nothing, the Lord will not hold us guiltless. He's silenced in the face of evil is evil. To do nothing and to say it doesn't matter, that is not God. And, and I really think a lot of us, uh, you know, we've kind of gotten lulled in this idea that it doesn't matter. That is not the voice of God. That's the voice of the devil. And the church needs to wake up and be God's voice and hands and feet in this world. That's mm -hmm. our job. And I do want to close with that saying, and we can even over-spiritualize it, like use a verse that says we're supposed to lead quiet lives. Well, you can't pick one verse out. You have to look at the context of scripture and go. what is the ultimate right. purpose of Christians and why are, why are we here? So man, I just could talk to you forever. Thank you for being on this show. Can you tell our listeners how to connect more with you about your show, about your books, all of that? Absolutely. I'm on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and everywhere else. Uh, my website is just my name, ericmetaxas.com. Uh, I run something called Socrates in the City, uh, which is also a really cool speaker series. I do a daily radio show. But uh, yeah, I would just encourage people to find me uh, at ericmetaxas.com or anywhere they want to look. And it's just a joy uh, to get to talk to your audience. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for tuning in to Unapologetic. Remember that you can hear today's episode and more at ptv.org slash Julia and wherever you get your podcasts.